So Luma Labs have released their new feature, Modify Video. Now, this is obviously a restylization of video from well, input video, so video to video, that is powered by their model, Ray 2. If you've been following the channel, you know that I'm a pretty big fan of video to video workflow, so I was excited to check this one out. And while I wouldn't qualify this as a full deep dive, this is kind of more like a first look, I did stumble my way into a few tips and tricks that might help you out if you decide to give it a shot. This is Ray 2's Modify. I feel like I should do something here. Let's just snap out of this. So video to video restylizations is obviously not something brand new. In fact, I'd say for many of us, our introduction to AI video came via Runway's Gen 1, which on launch was only video to video. Shortly after that came the Animate Diff era of sort of like weird, warpy, psychedelic video to video popularized, of course, by Kyber. And more recently, of course, there's been a lot of AI video in painting techniques such as Viggle, uh, popularized, of course, by the Little Yachty Joker viral video by AI Warper. But in terms of straight AI video restylization, it kind of has been a minute. So it was really nice to see Luma jump feet first into the pool, utilizing their newest video model, Ray 2. Now, one of the things that I love about video to video is how it allows you to get super creative uh, with props, such as my guy here using like an ice scraper um, and you know using that as an input to turn it into a Viking with an ax. I do love the fact that it's clearly summer uh, wherever he is there, uh, yet he's still got the ice scraper, probably sitting in his car, same man, not judging. Or in this example, utilizing uh, like two two bins, a broom and a dustpan, um, and then somebody you know, like writhing around underneath a blanket to turn it into a Viking ship. I mean, that's that's fun. Now, a lot of the provided examples are coming from a uh, well, friend of the channel, John Finger, who I jokingly refer to as AI Video's first movie star. But John's work always brings me a lot of joy, namely because when you when you see his behind the scenes stuff, you're very quickly reconnected with that feeling of, you know, being a kid and playing with your friends. But also using video to video offers you a lot more control. Uh, fingers, for example, AI video always struggles with fingers. Um, when you're utilizing a video to video process, you stand a better chance. So since John and the gang showcase a lot of what this model can do with footage that you're shooting, I thought that it might be an interesting idea to uh, take a different approach with pre-existing assets and AI video. Now I'll admit that I got off to a bit of a rocky start with the modify feature. Uh, my first test was taking this VO2 generated image of a, a noir detective in a back alley, and then we can bring him into Luma here um, that allows for a style frame uh, and then a couple of extra controls down here that we're going to go over in just a minute. So giving it the prompt, a cyberpunk noir detective in a crime alley in a cyberpunk city. Uh, what I'm going to do here is show you um, where it kind of does work. And then we're going to circle back into places that I, I don't think it works. Um, so because we have our video here, uh, what we can do is just click on this option button here and then hit start frame. So that's, uh, you know, obviously going to download um, the first frame of your input video nice handy feature right there. From here, I'm gonna bring it over to Midjourney's Retexture. Now you can use any of the various like retexture, restylizers that you want to, uh, like Flux Context, whatever. I just, I, I happen to go over to um, Midjourney for this. So landing on this image, which is definitely stylistically different from our input video. And just because I still have some free trial credits over on Topaz Bloom, uh, let's run it through a quick upscale on Bloom. Uh, apparently it did turn uh, whatever like little card he's holding here into a shot glass, but um, well, he's had a rough day, so we're gonna let him have it. This is what happens when you run things without prompts. So bringing that image back over to Luma, we can now uh, obviously add that in as a start frame. Uh, from here, you do have controls uh, for strength. Um, this will basically allow you to choose how much influence the model is going to give uh, to your video restylization. Um, down at the lower end, it adheres to the structure and the performance details. Uh, as you go up, flex would be the sort of the next level um, that preserves the structure, but might take some creative liberties. Uh, and then as you get into reimagine, that's, uh, you know, kind of where it's going to sort of do not necessarily its own thing, but it's going to kind of take matters into its own hands uh, to try to make the shot as best it can. Um, so for now, we're just going to leave it in the middle here. Uh, roll this and see what we get. So that initial shot comes out looking like this, which, you know, I can't really complain about. There's not a lot happening. It is sort of a boring shot. Uh, we do have the problem with the letterboxing, but that's, you know, that's pretty standard. You can always just go in and mask black bars on top of that. 
Running it again with the level cranked, well, I mean, obviously, there isn't too much of a change. We do get the black bars at the top, which is nice, and I think there's a little more, like, kind of smoke uh, in the background. Now, that said, running it without an image prompt and just using the text prompt, we, we do end up with this, which, um, I mean... <laughs> It's fine, I guess. Uh, we we it gets the general idea. It does look a little bit on the on the bland side. I don't want to necessarily bag on this too hard, uh, but we definitely do see kind of a lack of stylistic flair. Our cyberpunk detective guy kind of kind of now ends up looking like uh, like Harold from accounting. I mean, I guess it's kind of cyberpunk. He is holding like a flip phone with the holographic reading of like the Wi-Fi signal. I did experiment around a little bit more with it, but overall I do have to say that the, at least the text to video side of modifications is, it, it's, it, I don't know, it's not really doing it for me. Continuing on with the experiments, we did have this shot from uh, Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West. We look at this when Luma's uh, Expand first came out, uh, taking this out to like an ultra wide screen. So revisiting this shot and then this time giving it a retexture of Cyberpunk Western because, well, why not? Cyberpunk Western. And bringing that back over, uh, we end up with this shot, which is, I mean, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, there are some problems with it here and there, but, you know, overall, it, it, it is the shot from the film, uh, just now kind of redone with this kind of like Borderlands post-apocalyptic feel to it. Now, as always, is it perfect? Well, I mean, no, of course not. But I mean, also bear in mind, we took a shot from a film made in 1968 and turned it into something that looks like, you know, it, it could be from a modern video game. So there is that. Um, again, there are some slight problems here and there. You'll notice the character on the left there, uh, there's sort of like a face shake that's happening there. Uh, and old Chuck Bronson in the background. Uh, we really lose a lot of details on that character. But um, one thing to note is that, you know, from our initial opening image, there was no image. Uh, you know, character there. So this is the model kind of like trying to figure out who that is back there. And just as a note, here is the text to video output of, you know, that that same scene. Um, and while you do, have, you definitely do get a much more photorealistic output here, especially with the three characters in the foreground. Um, you know, obviously we are missing a lot of stylization here. It does kind of feel like, uh, like a Western shot by some student filmmakers somewhere in Syracuse. So my overall thought was to lean into that stylization as opposed to, you know, trying to force photorealism out of it. That said, I mean, we do end up with some pretty good photorealistic results. We'll take a look at those in a little bit. Um, but given that we were moving into stylization, I figured this would be a good time for the Starship Troopers test. So this is Starship Troopers Roughnecks. Uh, it's a CG animated show from the late 90s. I'm not going to say it was good, but at the time, a lot of us were like, there's a Starship Troopers show on TV. It was a very different era. Now, obviously, the animation has not aged well. So it always makes it a pretty interesting experiment to see what we can do with uh, you know footage like this with video to video. So, you know, hey, I'm doing my part. Dated as it is, that is still fun to me. All right, let's take it through Luma and see what we get. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. They're doing their part. Are you? Join the mobile infantry. Overall, not too bad. There are still, of course, some problems. Um, some weird frame rate issues uh, on that first shot in particular, but I think that actually might have been from the source footage. Um, lip sync is obviously a bit of a problem here. Um, and then actually, as, as, as we point forward, there, there's some fuzziness in the, in the hands and fingers there. But overall, I do have to say that this is the best that this test has looked yet. Yeah, we're a little ways off from, you know, me spending all my time trying to reskin a long forgotten show from the 1990s. But, well, we're on our way. Now, just to go over some limitations and problem spots, um, of course, this is uh, the famous running oneer from 1917. Seems to be like a de facto standard for uh, a lot of video to video tests. Now, one thing to note is that modify only allows you to do 10 seconds at a time. Um, so, you know, staying with the sort of Starship Troopers-esque theme, I ended up generating this image off the first frame uh, and then running that. We end up with this, which actually 
doesn't look too bad until or like right about the hit. Um, and then we slowly start kind of de decohering as the clip goes on longer. But I would say that run uh, and the first few seconds of this does look very good. This is something that I have noticed is that much like we saw in Kling 2.1, it's around that five second mark that things start to kind of get a little bit on the wonky side. Take, for example, my favorite Godzilla shot that I've generated. Uh, this was in Ray 2, uh, text to video. Um, yeah, I love this shot. Like, he looks so good in this. So modifying that shot with this as our first frame input shot, uh, we end up with this, which looks pretty good right up until about, well, the five second mark. And then you sort of get that, like, you know, the smoke dust thing, disintegration effect that's kind of happening there. You do get a little bit of like Godzilla's eye blinking there, but I think that can be rolled out. The problem, of course, being, you know, well, that. Um, there is a, a solution for that. We'll talk about that when we circle back to photorealism. The other thing that I was interested in trying out was the opening of Severance season two, namely because you have that camera rotation around Adam Scott's head. And I wanted to see if the model was capable of like remembering who that was essentially. And I mean, it kind of does okay. So taking that first frame and giving it kind of an illustrated look um, and then running that, we end up with this, which I mean, it does, it, it actually does hold stylistically and consistent. Again, we get up to that five second thing and that's where things start breaking down a bit. But again, I do want to point out that, you know, on that initial rotation, it actually does do a pretty good job there. It really isn't until after he steps out of the elevator that we run into problems like Mark kind of ends up turning into a untextured CGI character. Uh, it kind of looks like an old poser character, if anybody remembers that software. And just as an experiment, I thought it would be interesting to take that output and then re-input the initial actual first frame just to see what we got. And I, the results were actually kind of surprising because we kind of end up getting Adam Scott again, kind of. I mean, the action is wrong. He just kind of ends up spinning around and then he runs into a silver void where he turns into an Asian man. Um, but I mean, still, that, that opening right there with just the spin, that's kind of crazy. So as that idea of doubling up kind of got stuck in my head, I decided to grab uh, one of my favorite pieces of stock footage, uh, this scene. I don't know why this exists as stock footage. I'm just really happy it does. From there, I gave it a style transfer to this, kind of more in the cinematic realm. Um, there are some problems here. The guys, the chains on the back of that guy's uh, hat kind of uh, end up like sort of morphing and dusting out. But overall, I mean, retains the camera motion. Most of the action, his foot kind of vanishes a bit, but overall, not too bad. So taking the first frame of that output and adding yet another stylized pass on top of it, uh, we end up with this as an output, which, I mean, it, this looks pretty interesting. We definitely do run into problems, you know, post five seconds where things start to get a little bit on the soft side. But, you know, at least for that, those like opening frames, this is definitely a style that I would like to see more of. I definitely think there is something there in terms of doubling up, uh, considering that, uh, again, our Godzilla shot here, when I re-ran uh, that, that stylized output again with the first frame, we end up with this as a result, which, um, you know, yeah, Godzilla's got a bit of a blinking eye there. Uh, maybe that's why he's so mad. He's always got something and stuck in his eye. Um, but, um, you know, clearly we, we did lose out on the dusting feature, which is kind of nice. Now I will say I ended up with a lot of success uh, with this. This was originally a Ray 2 shot, um, you know, very, you know, Daniela Van de Donk dressed as a pirate uh, inspired, but we ended up with, uh, with Daniela Van de Depp. So modifying that shot and moving the slider all the way over, we ended up with this shot um, where she kind of ends up looking a little bit more like Evangeline Lilly. Um, but, you know, overall, it does a pretty solid job here. We do have that problem of that like billowing flag there and then some rando walking across. Um, so when I re-ran this again, modifying it again with the same input image, we end up with this, which does look a lot cleaner. So uh, this is definitely something that I'm going to experiment around more with. Rounding out with some community examples, uh, Sieru gives us um, some really, really cool looking video to animation restylizations. Once again, I do want to point out that this is a place that video to video does very well is with fingers and apparently with bulldogs as well. Uh, this is one spot where I think you can see what happens when you crank up the slider on the modification. It's not the same shot, but it, it very much has the same feel. Um, same thing with this shot. Two additional shots that I really liked uh, were this one. I do love the fact that the baby's got like, it's all blinged out on his fingers, uh, some big fat fingers. Uh, and then this shot of the dancing kids. That's that's really pretty impressive. Eric Chevier gives us uh, like robot gardeners, I guess, in the apocalypse uh, sourced from, you know, I presume stock footage at least. Um, yeah, this is really compelling. Uh, it's something that I think that you would probably have some level of difficulty trying to actually prompt for. 
finally, Theo Panagiotopoulos, hope I got that right, um, is a man after my own heart after all, because, well, he's doing him as a pirate. So um, yeah, good job, Theo. So overall, with Luma's Modify, is it perfect? Well, of course not, but what is an AI? Is it interesting, experimental, and fun? Yes, it absolutely is all three of those things. Now, again, this is only a few days old, so I do expect, you know, as the old saying goes, this is the worst it will ever be. But even as it stands today, I think that this is a pretty worthy tool to have in your tool belt. And again, at the end of the day, video to video workflows are just a lot of fun. We all walk around with a video camera in our pocket these days. So, you know, anything that encourages you to pull it out and, uh, you know, start shooting some stuff, I'm into. So I guess that's it for today. There was a bunch of other stuff that I wanted to cover, but I actually ended up just having a lot of fun with Luma. So um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get to it eventually. In the meantime, I thank you for watching. My name is Tim.